Thanks, Laura. We're, we're actually live now. So um, uh, sorry for we had a few technical difficulties in the background, but um, to everybody who's uh, on the line with us, uh, welcome. Um, it's good to virtually see you and be with you all again um, as we move into this holiday season. Hopefully everybody's staying safe and healthy. Um, I am uh, privileged to actually have uh, Gwinnell Avis Hewitt here with me uh, today. Uh, we're going to engage in a little conversation that will I think build on some stuff that she spoke about at the Baker Institute at our annual energy summit about a year and a half ago. Um, uh, for those of you who were fortunate enough to be there for that uh, for that event, uh, you might recall her discussion about Anji's vision of the future and the movement towards renewables and zero carbon. Uh, and uh, that really is the focus of our discussion today. So before I hand it over to uh, Gwinnell, um, who is the CEO of Angie North America and in charge of all sorts of things related to zero carbon energy ventures uh, with Angie around the world, um, I do want to remind you that you are free to ask questions, and I encourage you to do so through either the chat or the Q&A function uh, um, uh, on your screen. So, uh, Gwinnell, with that, I, I want to hand it over to you and, um, you know, by all means, uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you very much. Happy to uh, be there. I would have preferred to be in person, but next time, hopefully, it would be uh, possible. Uh, so just maybe to start with, I would like to remind uh, what is NG uh, all about and just maybe give my perspective around the landscape of uh, renewables globally, how investments are going and what's the future of renewable globally, if you allow me. So just maybe a few words about what is NG about. Um, so it's a company of uh, 170,000 employees across the world. Uh, we have a purpose, uh, what we call raison d'être. It's a, a purpose which is to act to accelerate the transition towards a carbon neutral world. And by which means, first reduction of the energy consumption and at the same time providing uh, renewables, providing uh, new solutions to decarbonize the planet. So basically two areas, reduction of consumption and at the same time providing uh, new consumption, new means of consumption via renewables. So basically, we have three main activities, client solutions, first activities. What this is about is to provide solutions to clients. We see many clients saying, I want to decarbonize. Okay, but how to do that? There are plenty of different ways, like energy efficiency measures, heating and cooling networks, distributed solar, numbers of different activities. And we say, okay, we are company you, we will decarbonize and we will provide a fully fledged set of solutions to do that. So this is the first area, client solutions. The second area is about renewables, and we have 30 gigawatt of operating operated capacity across the world. What this is about, it's half hydro, and the rest is wind and solar. But in this environment, I will, I will tell you more, it is moving so fast, so fast. All the technologies that we have today will be different in five years. Everything is going so fast. And so we are investing in new technologies like green hydrogen, like geothermal, like biomethane, like offshore, numbers of different technologies, because there is no one single solution. There are always pros and cons in every single solution. So we have to combine all the different technologies. And what we are doing is that we are developing, constructing, building and operating assets of three gigawatt, three new gigawatts a year. And so basically today we have 30 gigawatts in portfolio and we add every year three gigawatts and very um, rapidly we will add not three but four gigawatts a year. So a huge trend of development. And lastly, we are developing networks because without networks, nothing is possible. We need to transport energy, gas or electricity so networks is as important as production, and that's the three areas we are working on. Power and solutions, renewables, and power and gas networks. And when it comes to North America, that's exactly what we are doing. And we have 6,500 employees in North America. And what happened is that in the past years, we sold 10 gigawatts of power generation. It was mainly coal, mainly gas, and we reshuffled the portfolio to focus on Cloud solutions and renewable, especially. Why? Because client solutions, there are plenty of clients in North America that are asking for decarbonization. That's what we are doing with, for example, Ohio State University, asking for 50 years contract, where we take the commitment to reduce their energy consumption 
by 25% in 10 years, reduction of their energy consumption by 25% in 10 years. And with the University of Iowa, we were awarded a contract, a concession of 50 years to be very rapidly coal free. So because today their installation is based partly on coal, so to be coal free and to invest in many of different new technologies like solar distributed, optimization of the consumption, et cetera, et cetera. So numbers of different clients asking for the same. I want to decarbonize, please help us with different set of solutions depending on what's available locally and what makes sense for me. And in the second area, renewables in North America, we had nothing, nothing a year ago. And this year, in the middle of COVID, we are building two gigawatt this year, two gigawatt just in one year. And we've been developing um, a tax equity financing this year of 1.6 billion with Hannah Armstrong, um, uh, tax equity financing and then sell down of the project with Hannah Armstrong. So all in all, it's two gigawatt under development and lots of tax equity financing in the middle of COVID. So it means that there is appetite. It means that this industry is very resilient and it means that there are clients that want to consume green energy and therefore we need to develop projects. So basically that's what is happening. And because it, we are in Texas, I want to give you a Texan example, if you allow me. Please. We were in discussion with Microsoft and they were saying, well, I want to have green energy consumption, but you know, what I don't like is for solar and wind, it's not always available. So I want something reliable 24 seven for my data center that is in San Antonio, what can you do for me? And basically we've been working uh, for them and um, we've been developing uh, a park, Las Lomas, a wind farm of 200 megawatt and another one of solar, um, also Ansen solar plant that is under construction. So two farms, one wind farm, one solar farm and they are very complementary in terms of profile of production. And when you mix the two, it's almost a base load, 24 seven. So it's a green solution 24 seven and both parks are being developed in Texas. So it's a 100% Texas solution, 24 seven available for a data center in San Antonio. And today we are building those parks. They will be available at the end of the year and we will publish it on Twitter. You will see on my account. So just a Texan solution for a Texan client for this San Antonio data center. So there are plenty of different solutions and that will be always dollar made based on what's necessary for the client. And finally, one thing about offshore, because we are talking a lot in North America about solar, onshore, wind, et cetera, but we see also some developments on offshore. We are developing projects in Massachusetts. We have 50% of Mayflower project together with uh, EDP, it's an 800 megawatt project for which we've been awarded a PBA contract with Massachusetts Utilities. So there are some developments. It takes more time, it's very difficult, very innovative, but there are also other possibilities. And again, there is no one single solution. I cannot say that solar is perfect. I cannot say that offshore is perfect, but what makes sense is the combination of different technologies based on where we are located, where it makes sense, where the resources uh, is, and all in all, that's how we see the renewable market. And maybe if you allow me now, one point about, about the renewable global market, what this is about. We, everybody is talking about renewable, but how, how fast is it developing? And basically today, uh, in 2019, uh, renewable power capacity was accounting 35% of the total global power capacity, 35%. So it's not nothing, it's not a gadget, it's not an ID, it's something real, 35% of total global power capacity. And when you look at the growth, new capacity being developed, how much coming from renewable? 70% of the world power capacity addition is coming from renewable. So the growth in terms of power capacity is coming from renewable. So sometimes the question is, why is this growth for renewable? Is it led by the governments? And I would say it's a combination. Again, governments taking strong positions sometimes, national or local authorities also 
taking some strong positions, but not only. We see lots of private sectors, corporates, asking for this growth. And therefore, we see numbers of what we call corporate PPAs, power purchase agreement, being developed because there is this tendency, this trend, the commitments taken from uh, the private sectors to have to consume green. And at the same time, why it is happening? It's because it's cheap. Like a few years ago, it was much more expensive and technology innovation and cost reduction is there. And I was thinking when I was preparing that, in 1990s, what was a turbine? It was 60 feet height with a capacity of 100 kilowatts. Today, it's almost 10 times higher and 60 times more powerful. Each blade is like the, as tall as a Boeing 747. So you see the technology is evolving extremely fast. And at the same time, in 10 years, wind turbine prices have dropped almost 60% and even more for solar, 90% cost reduction in 10 years. So it shows that we are there with this dynamic also because there is technology innovation and cost reduction, and therefore it's a no brainer. We have to go for it. And it's exactly what's happening in the US because fossil fuel currently generate 60% of the electricity, but coal share has dropped by almost half in the last 10 years. It was awarded 46% 10 years ago, and now it's only 24%. And it was displaced by gas and renewables. At the same time, renewable production has increased by 40%, 40 times from 0.5% to 20% in North America. And this is massive and it's just the beginning. So you see, I'm very optimistic about renewables because it's driven by a strong momentum at local level, national level, and from the corporate side. Absolutely. You're, you're not just optimistic. You're very passionate about it. I think that comes through very, very, uh, very clearly. Um, so you mentioned a couple of things, actually, in, in, in your remarks there. And, and one that, that, that really struck me was um, you used the word networks um, and how you're leveraging networks really to integrate more renewables, um, leveraging gas infrastructure um, where possible. Uh, but it, it reminded me of something that a couple of my colleagues, they, they recently published looking at um, how infrastructure investments, transmission in particular in Texas has evolved in the, in the development of the CRES and what that has meant for wind power in the state. And there, there's, a, there's a line in their article, um, in, the, in the executive summary of the article that says there can be no utility scale green without transmission infrastructure. Um, and I wonder if you could maybe uh, spend a couple of seconds giving your, your thoughts on the role of infrastructure in really facilitating uh, the broad expansion of renewables, because there's a lot of uh, discussion about that and whether or not this will be all distributed or whether it'll be interconnected. And, and, and your thoughts on that would be much appreciated. So you're right. And uh, our vision is, again, that there is no one single solution. Uh, the development will be both at the same time distributed and at the same time, it is the scale. And, uh, and therefore, what we see, and that will be um, extremely uh, uh, evolving in the coming years, is the presence of more batteries or storage capacities. And what we see in the market is that we see more and more clients asking for local development, local resources, like distributed solar, but it's not enough. And they're asking for solar plus batteries. So lots of local developments of this side. But now we have bigger clients that are more global in terms of footprint and they're asking for more global uh, supply. And therefore we see developments of PPAs, like global PPAs or larger PPAs and utility scale development. And this raises the question about the combination of the different technologies, wind plus solar, wind plus storage, solar plus storage. And this raises the question about the networks, exactly. We had one case, one very specific case in uh, Chile, for which all the production was in North Chile, and at the same time, all the consumption was in South Chile, and the two were completely disconnected. So it made completely sense to build a line, but then it took so many years. It's so difficult to build you know, lines, transmission lines, but it's absolutely necessary when we have to connect, to connect the two, and, and therefore, uh, we are developing infrastructure assets in that sense because it's critical. 
it's like a matter of life or death because it's absolutely critical for the country to connect the point of consumption and the point of production. And in that sense, we see our, our position as a, a solution provider for solution, a local solution for a given client when it's, it makes sense when it's possible, like solar or storage, as I mentioned, or different combination of this size. But at the same time, it's not enough. For large consumption, we need to go for utility scale. And to do that, we need to see the impact on the, on, on the transmission line, on the networks, because it's more volatile, it's more intermittent. We have to, for transmission operators, it's something that they have to manage. And therefore, asking for more combination of renewable plus storage in a way or another is also part of the solution. Very good. Um, so I, I, I'm also, you, you've also mentioned in your remarks how the solutions are different everywhere. And that's actually something that I wholeheartedly agree with and have written about. Um, uh, and in fact, even uh, this morning, I was on a discussion about uh, the integration of renewables and the energy mix in Latin America. And um, it was interesting in the context of that conversation, the role of hydro and how it can play a com complementary role in the need for transmission. So. Um, it's interesting to hear you say, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the solutions are different everywhere because I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And when you look at certain places uh, in North America, for example, if you get the United States, um, you know, you mentioned the offshore wind projects in Massachusetts. And those are very, the wind resource there is phenomenal. If you look at wind resource maps, for example, it's, it's among the best on the planet. Um, uh, but one of the uh, uh, impediments to larger scale development and truly making the system green is uh, the development of transmission infrastructure, which we know there has been a lot of um, discussion about, and in particular, even connecting to the hydro resources in Ontario and Quebec. Um, so in your, um, I think you mentioned you, there's an 800 megawatt wind project that you're involved there, um, uh, involved in there. In the development of that, with the PPA, with um, uh, 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 with with the onshore utility, with the utilities uh, there, what um, what role does uh, uh, transmission infrastructure in Massachusetts play? Vis you know, versus gas uh, deliveries versus um, I guess what I'm getting at is how does the energy mix in in New England evolve, right, with the integration? <laughs> Because it's a, it's an open question, and it's one that I think a lot of people are wrestling with right now because of that transmission, uh, that transmission issue. So I'm not sure that I'm the best place to respond to this question. We are a solution provider, and that's why we thought that it makes sense to develop offshore in this, uh, in this area, in this environment, because as you said, the the, the weather, the wind is phenomenal. And uh, the depth in the sea is, is quite good to do fixed offshore. So it's a no-brainer solution, but it has to be developed in a in a uh, in a way that is with consultant consultation of the local authorities, local stakeholders, the fishermen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because it raises numbers of different questions. But I mean, this is based on again local resources, and it makes sense in this area to develop this kind of technology. And also because there is less place, less room available for onshore wind, and in that sense, it's you know it's an, it's a good option. But for example, um, as another solution, we are working uh, in California uh, with um, uh, in, uh, we are also partner in a red in the Redwood Coast floating offshore wind project in California. And you will ask me why floating offshore against lots of wind resources but the debt in the sea is very high. So it's not possible to do traditional offshore. Fixed offshore is not possible at all. So when uh, in this kind of geographies, it could make sense to develop new technologies like floating offshore. It's amazing how it works. It can be far away from uh, the coast and then you capture lots of wind and, and therefore you have more reliable energy supply and uh, it's something that we are working on uh, in California, and we have already developed off floating offshore in other geographies where it makes sense for the same reason. Lots of resources, high debt in the sea, and therefore fixed was not working, floating was the best solution available. But then the question is cost. How costly it is? And I have to say it is very costly, but cost will decrease as soon as investments will be developed, such as what we did for onshore, such as what has been done also for solar. So that's why I think that you know, a solution 
uh, that we can have for Massachusetts, for California in a given day can be different five years later or 10 years later because of this evolution of the technology. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. You you did just mention um, consultation with local stakeholders, and that's actually a big uh, point of emphasis in a lot of the research we've been doing. You actually see more success with these with the integration of these new new types of technologies, where you have that broad uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, so I think that's fantastic. Um, you also just mentioned the development of new technologies, and you know I I firmly believe that if it comes down to a, a question of whether or not uh, uh, innovation can be applied to develop a new solution, don't bet against you know human beings because we'll figure out a way to do it, right? So um, innovation is is critical. It always has been. But I wonder if you could maybe spend a little bit of time talking about um, not just because I think you've given this some attention already how innovations have already impacted Anji's vision um, and what y'all are actually involved in. Uh, but what sorts of things are you looking forward to, um, and how how do you think you'll be able to integrate those into your in, into what Anji does, not only in North America but around the world? I think that there is one point that we did not discuss is the role of digital in this activity, and I think that's something absolutely critical to make uh, renewables, the energy transition solutions, being um, you know. Uh, optimized in terms of cost and uh, that is meeting the, 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 the client's needs. Just maybe one example, we have 10 gigawatts of wind and solar capacity around the world. It means thousands of windmills and millions of solar panels. So lots of different assets. We have been developing a platform, a digital platform, when we, where we connect all the data coming from all the assets. In one windmill, you have 100 sensors. So we capture lots of data in real time, and we have been developing advanced uh, AI algorithm. And uh, with that, we are not only doing predictive, uh, you know, uh, forecast of weather and the impact on the production, but what we are doing is what we call predictive maintenance. The objective is really to say this wind blade will fall in like six months. So we have to repair it right now because we know that it will fall in six months. So the wall is just to give an example of how important it is to develop digital tools to monitor all these assets to be uh, more, uh, to have operating assets that are optimized and that are delivering well, well advanced, well, in, a, in a well advanced position. And uh, when it comes to predictive maintenance, that's something that we absolutely need to develop. And another example is um, we've been working with members of university, as I mentioned before, they want to decarbonize, they don't exactly know, et cetera. We've been um, developing smart institution platform. It's a tool with C3, uh, the Tom Siebel company. And, uh, and the tool is all about collecting all the data from with different various sources, from the university. So we collect everything in real time, like bills, smart meters, et cetera, processes, et cetera. We all look at all those data, we process all those data, and we propose solutions to optimize energy consumption and to reach their sustainability goals. And that's exactly what we did during COVID for Ohio State University, because what happened is that suddenly all the students, they could not go to the university, they were sent back to home, and we had to reduce the consumption of the university. It could have taken like days and days to work on all the elements. Everything was done like in two days or in a few hours, thanks to uh, the smart institution platform. So the role of digital in our sector is absolutely critical. And we are working with numbers of uh, companies like C3 to innovate all the time to make it well performing. And it's in addition to the technology itself and the way it's evolving. For example, I get the uh, I mentioned solar, I mentioned green, but there are other different technologies that are developing like H2, green H2. It's a new revolution that everybody is talking about. But in addition to this technology element, there is for me the digital component that is absolutely critical. Yeah, so um, it's actually good to hear you talk about efficiency in two ways, because most people don't do that. You mentioned operational efficiencies that AI and digital technologies can bring, but you've also commented a lot on um, efficiency of end use, right? Cutting waste effectively out of the system. And that is a virtual source of supply. It's a powerful one. So that's uh, that's actually really interesting to hear you discuss. So 
You've mentioned COVID a couple of times, um, mm -hmm. and I want to lean in on that a little bit because certainly, I mean, 2020 is a year that's going to go down in history as, you know, um, uh, a year of many things. It's an adjective unto itself in many ways. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you view what COVID has done to the energy ecosystem, what it means for the energy transition, um, and how you're uh, flexing. You already mentioned resilience in the uh, renewable energy space, and certainly I think that's that's un undeniable. Um, but I wonder if you could maybe use that as a, as a as a potential guidepost for how things might unfold in the coming years. Yes, you're right. I think that um, uh, what we can notice for for uh, for the COVID uh, is that renewable has been uh, much less it by COVID than other conventional energy. For example, at our Q3 results, financial reserves, we announced that our renewables activities uh, was experiencing 25% uh, organic growth by comparison to last year. So can you imagine in the middle of COVID, uh, in Q3 results, 25% organic growth by comparison to last year. So it was much less each than conventional energy but I cannot say that everything was perfect because as you can imagine, it's a supply chain tension issue because uh, lots of lockdown and during the lockdown, we could not have access to the, to the plants and especially where um, the equipment is manufactured. And therefore there were lots of tension in the supply chain itself. So there were lots of questions around that. And then my CEO was asking me, so will you deliver the objectives regarding renewables? And I have to say that I committed to deliver three gigawatt for this year, and we will deliver three gigawatt. So, I mean, you have always room of maneuver. We have extremely brilliant team on the ground right now, developing projects in Texas, Oklahoma, Dakota, etc. It's amazing what's happening. And everybody was so dedicated. And I think it's also related to our purpose because our team knows why they are doing that. And I think it's, extremely valuable to see this commitment, this engagement. And we could have thought that some industries or some governments, because it's very challenging economically for them, would have find another um, priority. But I would say that climate change still remain a key priority for many governments. So that's very positive because there is no step back. Again, I would say that there is still a very strong momentum at the same time at the corporate level, but also at the government level. So it's still very positive. And when we look at uh, H1 uh, 2020 renewable production in the world, it increased by comparison to last year. So I would say lots of investments happening. And when, when I say lots of investment, every year it's around 200, 260 billion per year that are invested globally on renewable. And in 2020, it's exactly the same by comparison to last year. So it means that investments are still happening. And the message testimony is what we did during COVID. We had a major, major tax equity financing of 1.6 billion for two gigawatt of renewable. And this took place. And we signed the partnership with Hannah Armstrong for these two gigawatt and this took place. So nobody was like trying to escape because lots of, you know, very puzzled by this situation. People were committed and, and, and things are still happening. So I'm quite confident. But then the question is about how to rebuild the economy after COVID, how to rebuild the economy. And I think that the trend that we are seeing, say, uh, we are seeing regarding the energy transition will not stop. Because COVID, during COVID, we realized that we have global battles in front of us. And among which climate change is there, and we have solutions that are affordable and for which we have competencies. And when I say competencies, is people on the ground working on those technologies. And in the US, for example, uh, the job, uh, job related to zero carbon community, it's 600,000 workers working on that. So that's not small. It's a new area, but still already it's you know, providing jobs, real job on the ground so there is an opportunity to build a more sustainable system tomorrow. Great. Um, so you just, you, you hinted at something and I wanna kind of pull on that thread a little bit because there, there are some questions coming through that 
are, are getting around this a little bit, but you mentioned supply chain risks that were made evident, right, during um, during during the past year because of the shutdowns and the uh, inability to access certain various various parts of the value chain. So, what uh, how how have how have you leveraged that uh, in terms of learnings, and where do you think? Uh, uh, the sector might shift to overcome those um, those those types of risks, right? Because we do know in the in the broad renewable supply chain, there are certain choke points that are emerging in terms of processing capability for errors and minerals, or um, you know any number of other things. But I wonder how um, you're sort of viewing the future and how you're thinking about flexing so that you can develop a more resilient supply chain as as renewables continue to grow. Right. So um, the first reaction that we've been uh, uh, experiencing is that we need to relocate everything uh, in a given country. Hmm. This is obviously not possible. So there is always a middle ground. Uh, you, you have good, good production in different uh, areas of the globe. We saw some bottlenecks for sure, but we managed. And what we've seen is that our suppliers del delivered uh, the equipments Sometimes with a few delays, but again, we managed to, did, to do uh, the work that, you know, the commitment that we've been taken, the three gigawatt, we deliver on time. So what I learned, what, what are my takeaways from this challenge is that first, we need to diversify. Second, we need to, to make sure that all what is possible, including the EPC, what we call the EPC, engineering product uh, a procurement and construction is a local activity. Huh? The construction is local, the operation is local. And so we need to have, you know, a, a, a network of uh, local uh, stakeholders uh, on this part of the supply chain. And then for the rest, for uh, the equipments uh, of the different components of renewables, the diversity is the best. And uh, and uh, and we'll see how things are evolving. But uh, what I retain is that it was resilient at the end. Yeah, um, that's excellent. So I've uh, I'm going to turn to some of the audience questions now, um, and they are actually tied to some things that you um, have referenced uh, so far. Uh, one in particular is uh, actually more than one in particular, but but getting at the uh, role of uh, capital access, so access to capital, the role of sustainable finance, sort of uh, green bond markets, you know, those sorts of things. Um, how important is that for the continued growth and expansion of renewable energy? Um, and to build on that, uh, what role does uh, the sort of ESG movement that is emerging in investor communities and, and the role of consumer preferences, what roles do all those play in terms of driving uh, driving the course for energy transitions as we go forward. Yes, uh, you're right. What, what we see is that investors are asking for uh, uh, more deployment of capital uh, around um, companies that are having a strong ESG position. Uh, and, and, and that's why also we did this turnaround of the company because like, again, five years ago, we were focused on the other activities. And with this, this turnaround also because we, so this appetite of the of the of the market toward, towards more investments on companies having strong, very ambitious ESG policy, and maybe to give you an example, um, just uh, last week, what we did is that we issued uh, 850 million hybrid bonds in green bond format, and uh, uh, we had secured uh, the carbon rate was 1.5 per annum, so it's very lowest level ever that we achieve by a company for age year maturity. So it means that there is strong, very strong appetite. This is incredible what has been achieved. Again, it's the lowest level ever that has been achieved by a company for age year maturity. So the message is that, yes, there is appetite, strong appetite for the market. It's not easy, never easy to take a uh, you know, very strong differentiated ESG position and for me, it's a combination of different elements. Is greenhouse emissions reduction. It's uh, the power generation for our side. So the share of renewables activities in our power production capacity mix. But it's also diversity. And I think that everything is coming together. It's diversity and inclusion. And we've been quite vocal as NG in the past months 
because we think that we have a role to play also in this area. And we've been working with other companies in order to take very strong position around diversity and inclusion, because we think that this is part of our corporate social and environmental responsibility targets to be well positioned on this area. So on greenhouse gas emissions, we already divided by two our emissions, but we have set targets for 2030 to again reduce our emissions uh, to reach 43 million ton. And today we are 80 million ton. So just to show that there is a path, we are doing the same for renewable production that should account for 58% of our mix in 2030. By comparison, today we are 28% uh, in renewables. And in diversity, we have a gender diversity target. But at the same time, we have a very strong position on diversity and inclusion all in all, including training people around those issues and including on taking stance externally on this activity. I think that that's fantastic. I mean, one of the one of the benefits that I think uh, I, I, I hope everybody realizes that diversity actually brings is you get an intermingling of thoughts that might not otherwise coalesce. And that's where creativity is born. You come up with just fantastic solutions. So I think that's amazing that you're you're taking such a strong role in, on that front. Um, a couple of questions have come through uh, about end of life management and recycling. Um, I wonder if you could spend a few minutes talking about how Anji is viewing uh, that part of the value chain and, and what your plans are for the future there. That's a very good question. Um, I have to say that uh, not everything is, uh, is well known as of today uh, on, uh, on wind. Uh, we have the first uh, wind farms being um, implemented, being um, uh, built uh, like uh, 20 years ago in France. And we had to dismantle uh, those farms, those blades and those, those farms. And how to recycle the different components. Everything can be recycled except the blades. Today, it, nobody knows how to recycle the blades. So we've been working uh, with uh, Suez, with a, um, a pilot project. We've been dismantling all the farm, and we've been working on a research project in order to be able to dismantle and recycle the blades. This is a very difficult topic. Nobody knows how to do it. So we need to take a stance because we have numbers of wheel farms across the world. And the first one that we implemented 20 years ago now, they are in the situation that we have to deal with it. So that's why we took this position. Uh, we, are, we are working with them in order to have that uh, being shared and deployed when it's done. But this is a real question that uh, we wanted to take a step uh, uh, in the direction of making that happen. And we have also many questions around, you know, wind farms, uh, they emit lots of um, greenhouse emission gases in their production life. And what we've done is that we've, followed uh, the greenhouse emission cycle when we implement a wind farm. And what we can say is that in two years of production, uh, of wind farm production, we are already compensating all the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions that have been produced to make the wind farm uh, being implemented. So just to show that we are also running, uh, you know, um, greenhouse gas emission cycles when we develop a project to make sure that we have uh, a net zero or reduction of greenhouse gas emissions while we do those developments. So this is for wind. For solar, um, uh, in Europe, there is um, you know, um, a mechanism that has been developed in order to recycle solar panels, and this is easier than the wind farms. So there is already something that is happening, and there is um, a mechanism where we pay for it, and there is an industry, a factory that has been put in place to recycle the solar panels. So um, there is already a system for which we are uh, part of it. Very good. Um, yeah, life cycle analysis is certainly something that is becoming more and more uh, applied. Uh, I've got some colleagues that are doing a lot of work on that front uh, on a variety of different uh, energy uh, application. So it's good to hear um, uh, uh, hear your thoughts on that. So another question that, that has come up, and, and there's really two I really want to get to, but this one in particular, I know that you have some thoughts on, um, uh, developing versus developed nations. 
uh, and how we integrate renewables in developing nations, for example, that don't have well-developed uh, transmission grids uh, or infrastructure uh, in general versus the strategy in developed nations. Uh, if you could give us some of your thoughts on that, on that front, that'd be great. Yes, you're right. The question is a good question. Never easy to answer, but I think that uh, when we said we need to have solutions, it's also very valuable in this kind of question. So my what I what I can say is that we we've experienced a real change uh, in terms of carbon emissions in the last 20 years. CO2 emissions increased uh, strongly in non OECD countries like by more than 100% in the last 20 years versus OECD countries where it increased by 5%. And this caused a real shift because in 1990, CO2 emissions were almost equivalent between OECD countries and non-OECD countries, like 55, 45. <clears throat> and today, the ratio is very different. It's OECD countries, 35%, non-OECD, 65%. So you see, things are evolving. What does it mean? Should we stop the development in non ecd countries? No, obviously no. We need to accompany the economic growth in those countries. And we need to design solutions to enable this transition, this evolution, this, this economic growth to be more sustainable. And that's exactly how the question has been raised. In numbers of cases, we are uh, in discussion with many governments and we are providing solutions in many different uh, countries and, and that's exactly how it is, uh, it is raised. And that, therefore we have been developing um, uh, an, an activity um, with uh, the ability to develop uh, local solutions for uh, some uh, local governments or some local clients, uh, what we call solar home systems. You know, local, very local solutions, solar, biomass, hybrid solutions, 24-7 microgrid solutions. Uh, so numbers of different elements. We had a request, for example, in a given country in, in Africa to have small scale biodigesters, you know. So there are different solutions. But I think that what matters is really we accompany this economic growth and, and, and be able to be present not only in developing countries where we have this massive very well-known technologies like very utility scale wind, utility scale solar. In those cases, sometimes we need local social entrepreneurs smart dev uh, and develop uh, smart solutions for, uh, with them uh, with a combination of different uh, activities. Solar home systems is a good one. Solar biomass hybrid 24 seven systems with micro grids and with mini grids is another solutions. And honestly, that's, that's, again, a combination of things. And that's what we've been promoting, especially in Africa, but also in Southeast Asia, uh, because it makes sense for them. And again, there is no one single solution, but we are adjusting depending on what they really need. And then the second question is electrification, because right. then you can do distributed solar, distributed solutions, but progressively, those countries need to electrify and have grid grid electrification. And this is the other topic on how to accompany that to happen. But sometimes it will take 10 years. And by that time, they still need to have access to electricity. And that's why we have these distributed solutions. I see. Well, that's, that's great. So um, I've had, I've got a couple of questions that I think are related. Um, one is uh, sort of focused on intermittency and uh, associated with renewables and how sometimes you'll get a lot more power than you need at night, say, from, from wind farms. Um, and another was actually focused on wanting to know your thoughts on the future of green hydrogen. And I think they're they're interconnected. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that that front. Yes, again, that's that's a good question. Um, uh, the intermittency is the drawback the, of, of the renewables. We, ha we see two different solutions. Um, the first one is battery development, battery development. And, and again, we see lots of requirements uh, for some customers to have combination of wind plus batteries, solar plus batteries, etc. So that you can store the electricity and, and, uh, and use it when it's uh, needed. It's still expensive, but you know, there, we see a decrease of the cost. So that's positive. The momentum is there. So there is one element, but this is for um, short term storage. And then the, we have another solution for longer term storage, which is H2. H2 is hydrogen 
there are different ways to develop hydrogen and there are different colors of hydrogen, like green, blue, and, and uh, gray. So there are different colors of hydrogen. When it comes to your questions, we are talking about green hydrogen. What is it is that we are developing wind farm, solar farm. Then we are doing electrolysis of the water based on the power generated by the wind farm. Then we produce H2 and we can store H2. So it's a way to store electricity and to use it in different ways. Um, basically what we've been working on the H2 is that we see a lot of uh, use case for industries that are consuming hydrogen. For example, the refineries, the, miner, the mining industry, or uh, the ammonia, numbers of different industries that for their own processes, they need H2. And today they are consuming gray H2 based on fossil fuels. And they're asking to decarbonize. So a way to decarbonize is to transform it into a green H2. We have numbers of different projects uh, in, across the world, in Chile, Australia, in Europe, in different geographies, where we develop large wind farm, large solar farm. We do electrolysis, we do H2, and they consume for their own consumption. It's very large scale. The question, again, it's cost. And again, this is very costly, but it will decrease. It will decrease. So that's why investing now is absolutely critical, because what we see is that grid H2 and gray H2 will be at parity at the same level of crisis in 2030. It's in 10 years. So it will be very rapid. And that's why there is this huge momentum across the world. Everybody's talking about green H2 because we see this tremendous possibility, this huge market. And at the same time, we need to invest now to make sure that it will become competitive. So there's a, there's a couple of other questions that have come through that I think are tangential to a lot of what we've talked about, but um, in the interest of the of, of, of our viewers, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask them anyway. Uh, one is specifically with regard to nuclear power and what you think its role is in the energy mix going forward, and how ANGI is positioned to either facilitate or replace it, depending on what the what the strategy is. So nuclear um, is a carbon neutral technology. So that's uh, very positive on that regard. And we are operating seven nuclear reactors in Belgium. So we are already an operator of uh, nuclear. Uh, we think that uh, it makes sense for now. I mean, all the nuclear plants that we have, it is decarbonized tool. It's a decarbonized power production. So that's very positive in this transition. Now, if the question is, would you invest in a new nuclear reactor? The response would be no. And why? Because today it's more costly. It's because now the other technologies have proven that they can be efficient. They can provide a service that is very competitive. And therefore, you know, combination between wind solar plus batteries and sometimes also uh, having H2 or hydro or offshore, et cetera, it's less costly than investing in new nuclear plants. So basically our conviction is that we operate the existing ones because they were there, they are performing well, they are providing a service that is completely carbon free, but I would not, we would not invest in a new nuclear plant. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, the fixed cost is sunk. So operate the, the, you know, the highly efficient facility uh, without a doubt. Um, uh, another question that, that has come through, and I think this maybe ties to, I know Anji has a, a very deep um, and sophisticated research and development uh, group. Um, uh, one question in particular is, is tied to finding alternative uses for CO2. And I don't know if how, how much this connects with your natural gas business and, and, and what you're actually looking at on that front as a potential um, value add, if you will. So if you, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and make the following say, because somebody actually said this to me and it kind of resonated. It's um, uh, one of our, one of our uh, faculty here in, in civil and environmental engineering actually made the comment that it's not hydrocarbons that are the problem, it's carbon that is a problem. So if we could figure out a way to 
make use of the, the tremendous hydrogen carrying capacity that carbon holds, uh, and at the same time find something to do with the carbon, then we solve the problem. And I wonder to what extent Anji is looking at that with its natural gas assets in particular, and, and where you think that, that, how you think that might evolve going forward. Well, first, let me uh, tell you that, uh, yes, we have a good R&D um, uh, you know, activity within NG. And this is led by the Texan guy, whose name is Dr. Professor, Professor Michael Weber. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very glad that we have him. It's fantastic, phenomenal. Uh, and he has a very good uh, vision around uh, the position of gas and what could be done. So is very much working on the different uh, possibilities to green gas. So the objective is really first for us to find a way to have green gas being developed in a meaningful way, like biomethane, like hydrogen or different combinations, etc. So it's working very much on green gas. But you're right, there are different opportunities like CCS, like capture uh, and uh, the, the carbon and storage and things like that. We've been working a lot in the past. It's difficult. The economic model is never easy, but that's an area for which uh, there is strong development and momentum. And when it comes to hydrogen, I was talking about, about blue hydrogen, and this is based on CCUS, in fact. So that's also an area for which um, there is appetite, and there are clients asking for uh, blue hydrogen for their own de decarbonization. And in that case, it's based on capturing the CO2 and store, storing it. So it's another way to do it. So there are plenty of development. Uh, but for our side, we are mainly focused on greening the gas first. And there are other opportunities that is being worked elsewhere, uh, and especially on CCUS as a way to capture, capture the CO2 and store it. Excellent. So um, we're almost up against it on time, but I have a couple of questions that are related, and I, I would love to get your thoughts as, as, our, as would our, our um, viewers uh, on this front. Um, it really has to do with job opportunities. Um, you know, we've got students, uh, graduate students, undergrads that are watching, and, and uh, they always ask these questions when we have people of, <laughs> of your stature on uh, with us. Um, you know, what are the opportunities going forward? Um, are there opportunities for people who've developed skill sets that have been uh, applied in other industries, uh, such as project management skill sets, stuff like that. Um, because I think a lot of people are starting to see that there is real opportunity in an emerging and, and rapidly growing space, and they want to figure out whether or not they can fit, right? So I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about, in general, what you see uh, the opportunity set to be, and then maybe even drill down a little bit and talk about Anji's approach. So, uh just maybe one one comment. <laughs> I don't want to, but uh, I, I've been posting on LinkedIn. Um, one thing that is responding to the question is that I've been launching a graduate program on renewables because I think that it is really an opportunity for students, and there is plenty an avenue of development. Again, it's a growth uh, area for which we will need skills. We will need competencies. And uh, therefore, we decided like uh, a month ago to launch a graduate program to have, you know, people coming, uh, students coming from fresh graduated to have the opportunity to discover these activities, you know, that changing activity from one activity to another one within the renewable sectors so that they can discover different, uh, you know, elements, brick of the value chain, and they can think what could be their future. So it's another, another way to discover the different competencies that are required within the value chain of renewables. So we developed this graduate program, but what we can say is that there will be lots of uh, requirements and uh, an appetite uh, for um, engineering uh, position, uh, for um, construction, uh, for uh, operations, uh, for mechanical numbers of different components, but also for data scientists, because again, we should never forget that renewable, to develop efficiently renewable, we need data, we need data scientists, we need to work on digital, and that's, that's also an area for which we are looking for, you know, kind of, um, you, know, you know, competencies to bring uh, within engine. Excellent. 
So uh, Gwinnell, I wanna just extend a, a, a tremendous thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're up against it on time, um, but uh, I'm sure that based on the number of questions that came through, you stimulated a lot of thought. Uh, to those who are watching, because we did receive one or two questions about uh, whether or not this will be available uh, later, it will be. We actually um, uh, leave uh, recordings of all of our uh, webinars online through our events page. So you're welcome to go to the Baker Institute website and find those there. Um, uh, hopefully everybody has a safe and healthy um, week, weekend, holiday season, uh, and uh, definitely look forward to seeing next time. And Gwinnell, hopefully next time I get to see you, it'll be in person again. Um, I certainly look forward to that. I hope so. Thank you very much, Kev. A Thank pleasure. You. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care.